Welcome to the Trust Factor Radio, bringing you interviews and insights to unlock the power of the subconscious mind to create authority, credibility, and trust with your host, the authority architect and best-selling author, Neil Howe. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and today my special guest is Mo Bono. Uh, Mo and his company, the Bono Idea Group, help people with a deep expertise, learn to fall in love with business development activities, land more of the profitable, desirable business that they want, and have fun while doing it. He is also the best-selling author of the Snowball System book, How to Win More Business and Turn Clients in to raving fans. Uh, I am definitely excited for this interview. This is exactly what a lot of uh, our listeners and the people that I interview want to know is how to get uh, more clients for their business. So welcome to the show, Mo Bono. Hey, thanks, Neil. I'm excited to be with you today. Yes, like I said, I'm very excited uh, for this exercise, and I know you've written a great book, The Snowball System, uh, where you outline how to win more business and uh, close more sales. So we're going to get into what's in that book in a minute, but uh, give us a little bit more about yourself, Mo, and your background and how you got started with the Bono Idea Group. That's, it's an interesting path, Neil. You and I haven't talked about this yet, so maybe there'll be some surprises for you too. But I started my career in what people would not expect, which I was an actuary. So probably the, the geekiest mathematician kind of uh, professional alive. And I passed all the actuarial exams, became what they call a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, their, their highest designation. And the consulting firm I was working for wanted me to move to an account management role. And that's one a role I wanted too. I was really excited about it. And I walked into my office on my first day. I changed floors. I changed offices, moving into my new space, new reporting structure, new boss, new system around me in the same firm, but all new people around me, new role. And uh, I talked to my boss and asked him, hey, where's the manual? Where's the, where's the book on business development? Because I know you do it so well and you know my new peers do it so well. Here where I'm at, how do you do it? I'm used to studying. I was an actuary. I've studied for 24 exams and I, can, I passed all those and I'm really excited to study and be your best. And he slapped me on the back and said, Mo, there's, there's no manual, you know, treat the client <laughs> right. And uh, Neil, I was scared to death. And now that my bonus is hitched to client growth as opposed to client service, like it was, you know, the day before, literally. And uh, I just, out of fear, started taking notes and trying to cobble together a system of why does this work here? And why does that client's yes to that, but no to that? Why do they like this person and not that person? What's the behavioral science, psychology, neuroscience behind influence and helping others and hacking your own habits? And uh, over, over years, I started to figure that out. And then in a couple of months, it'll be 13 years since we started Bundle Idea Group. And since then, we've trained over 12,000 people at over getting close to 400 clients now all over the world. And I, through that whole process, I not only fell in love with business development, but fell in love with teaching others business development. And, and that's what we focus on now. Hmm. So that's very much like me. I like to get into the whole psychology behind yeah. you know, why people buy. I think it's extremely interesting. And, you know, having those systems set up is uh, very important so that you can actually measure, which uh, was something being an actuary, I'm sure that was extremely important to you. You yeah. can measure, you know, really what makes the difference. But let's talk about the clients for a minute that you help. Uh, what kind of clients is it that you like to help? Yeah, it sort of falls into three buckets. Um, one is... And well, the theme across all three are people that have sort of one foot in a deep expertise and one foot in finding people to purchase it. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the three buckets that fit that really well are professional services. So we've just worked with uh, a, a bunch of the AMLAW 100, a ton of lawyers, consultants, accountants, architects, engineers. And then the second bucket is account managers and account executives and salespeople at big service-based companies. So uh, business process outsourcers, technology companies, healthcare companies, some of the biggest in the world. And then the third bucket are freelancers and, and business owners. 
because they've got to not only deliver on the services that are purchased, but also find the next client or customer. So that that bucket of folks is a really great, uh, really great group of for us to help as well. Mm. So what's the, mo- the main problem that all these people have? I think the first thing, there's a couple, um, and I'd love your view on this because you, you see into this world every day as well. But the biggest one is people can come to the conclusion incorrectly that business development is this thing that you're born with. You know, only Jane can talk to people the way she does. I couldn't do that or whatever. And it's just not true. The, the best research I've come across on this is by Dr. Uh, Anders Erickson out of Florida State. He's the worldwide expert on expertise. He's the expert on experts <laughs> and how they got it. And what he has found is that overwhelmingly, anybody who's good at a complex skill learned it and earned it. And business development fits in that strike zone perfectly. So yeah, sure, one person might be um, born gregarious or another one might be born at, you know, don't take no for an answer or whatever. But the complex suite of skills you need to be great at business development is, is in the hundreds. And where one person might enter with five things they're naturally good at, another with a different five, there's still so much they don't know. And each of those people can get incrementally better and eventually great at BD if they, if they focus on that with the diligence they focus on their core expertise, they can become great at BD too. Right. There's certainly, uh, they put a lot of effort into their expertise and they forget about that whole sales part and think that just because they have the expertise, people are going to come to them. Um, so how do you get them to become a salesman so that they can actually sell these services? You got it. That's the magic question. So if they can overcome the hump that it's a learnable skill, then we can teach them the techniques. Um, in our classroom training, We've got 17 different modules. In the book, all those are covered as well. And it it really boils down to three big buckets of things. One is, how do you manage your opportunities? Create an amazing buy-in process where the new prospect, the client, the customer, they're, they're so excited, they're actually guiding you to a yes because you're unfolding the buying process in the proper way. You can go deeper on that if you want. The yeah. second thing is, how do you manage your relationships? Um, relationships are very important. A, a great sale might make your year, but a, but a great relationship could make your entire career if it's the right one and fostered with authenticity and helpfulness and proactiveness. And then the last thing is managing yourself. So if, if, you've, if you're this magical person that's got one foot in expertise and one foot in finding people to buy, the, buy it, then it's so easy to fall back on ignoring the BD things and just focusing on delivery. Like you said, do sort of do great work in the phone will ring kind of mindset. And we've got to learn in that third bucket of how do we manage ourselves so that we can hack our own habits and keep business development moving forward all the time. So manage your opportunities, manage your relationships, manage yourself. There's dozens of skills that roll up into those three, but those are sort of the big three that we focus on. Hmm. Well, let's uh, break these down. And if anybody is listening, doesn't have a pen and paper, now would probably be a great time to go grab one. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's break down uh, the how to manage the opportunities then. What exactly does that mean? And, and what are the, the steps to manage that? Yeah, so sort of five big steps. Um, one is lead generation. How can we get in the door with value? Um, and in the book, we we cover nine different ways to do that. Some are with warm leads, some are cold, some are very targeted. I want to meet Jane at this organization or very broad reach, like I'm going to speak at this conference, but I'm not sure who's going to walk up at the end of the uh, of, of my speech. So those nine ways are broken down in a way that fits anybody's, anybody's uh, skills and what they're great at. The second piece is once that person walks up at the end of the speech or you get the warm introduction, listen and learn. And the idea there is we want to start with the other person. The research here is by a researcher, Dr. Diana Tamir. She's one of my favorites. And she's found that when people talk about themselves and specifically about their personal opinions of things, that they, the pleasure center of their brain lights up. So we want to start with them, not with our boring PowerPoint about all of our stuff that we've got to sell. We want to start with them so we can create a buy 
figure out what their priorities are, get that pleasure setting uh, uh, lighting up, which leads to the third step, which is create curiosity. How do we start to instill a little bit of curiosity in how we might solve their needs or help them with their priorities? The research there is by Dr. Uh, Matthias Gruber. He's my favorite. And he's found that people say yes more often. Other researchers found people negotiate less with things they are curious about. Once we've talked about their priorities, how we might solve them, the fourth step is building everything together. And that's where in the book and in our training class, we go into great detail on all the little incremental yeses that people can get so that they're getting little buy-in along the way and engaging the prospect or the client so that when it comes time for the fifth step, gain approval, that's where you get the yes, the statement of work sign, the, the matter begins, whatever it is, to get started. That gain approval should be so easy because there's just one little yes to ask for, one little ask at the end, as opposed to a whole bunch, because we build the whole, uh, the whole solution together with the client. So those five yeah. steps are just awesome um, when followed in the right order. Right. I, I really like that. And, you know, this kind of goes into developing that relationship as well as, yes. uh, you know, all throughout, you're not pushing for a close, pushing for a close, pushing for a close all the time. You're educating them, you're creating that curiosity and you're, you know, getting that yes ladder as it is, you know, those little yeses along the way to where, it just makes sense to them. It's, uh, that's uh, you know a, a very nice system to go through, and it's yeah. got to be done in that correct order. It really does. You know, um, there's a, there's times when there'll be little nu nuances of changes. Like, um, let's say the lead lead gen happens. Let's say you gave a great speech. Somebody walks up to you and they and they want to jump straight to you. Um, you know, hey, how would you solve this problem? There's no, pro there's no problem with answering that. So that would almost like go skip over, listen and learn and straight to curiosity, create curiosity because you don't know about them. But you might want to keep that answer very brief. Well, I'm not sure how we'd apply the law in that case. Let's say I'm a lawyer. Um, but if you tell me, but, but I know there's a solution. Um, if you tell me a little bit more about yourself and what, what you're worried about or what your priorities are, then I could, I could tell you with specificity how we might solve that without digging in any deeper. So sometimes it takes a, a, a quick skip forward, but, but we don't want to hang out there long. We want to go back to the next incremental step to really make this work well. Neil, does that resonate at all with you? It does. It's like the, you know, going to a doctor. You tell your doctor all the pains and ailments that you have. They listen yeah. uh, and then they prescribe. And it's not very often you're going to tell your doctor no, is it? I love that example because, you know, when we're the customer, if you will, or the client or the doctor, the patient in this case, if we just walked in the door and he said, you need this prescription and he didn't listen to you at all, it'd feel a little awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> but in your, your example, so great because we, it shows the power of how much we want to be heard. We want to start with us. When we're buying something, we're sort of magically important. Um, in a way that we aren't in other circumstances. And I think we, as a purchaser of services, as a buyer, we really want to talk about us. Let's give people that, that experience and then we can start to talk about us after we know what their priorities are. Hmm. Yeah, there's nothing worse than uh, having somebody coming up and talking about all about themselves and their business all the time. And you just know that there's going to be a sales pitch coming soon. Yes. Uh, you know, rather you put the emphasis on building that relationship, which is great. So talk, talk to me more about the relationship, which is that second uh, bucket yeah. that you're talking about. Uh, how do you manage those relationships? Yeah, managing your relationships is so important. And a lot of... Um, professionals and business owners can ignore this because it feels soft and we want to turn those soft skills into hard results. So the, the research here, and there, there's just a dozen or so studies that are just cited in our book alone in our training classes, but the number one I like is a researcher named Dr. Jerry Berger. He's out of Santa Clara University. And what he has proven in multiple studies is that people spend more money with people they like. And that makes, sort of makes sense on the surface. 
the what people can come to the wrong conclusion though when they hear that is like oh likability is uh, unchangeable you know people either like you or you don't that's actually not true at all so when we're talking about manage our relationships we want to be able to use the levers at our disposal that correlate to likability for the specific people that are the most important to our future success not the not the people we know the best now necessarily some of that some of those folks could be on the list but we want to focus on the people that are most important so I'll, I'll give you three steps. Um, one is we help people write down a list of their most important relationships. Um, I'm 51, so I've probably got, uh, because we train so many people, I've got 10,000, 15,000 people in my Rolodex. In our, you know, we use a CRM for that, but there's no way I can keep in touch with 15,000 people. So other people might have 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, whatever. They've got to write a list down, a short list of their mo most important relationships. What we find if people don't do that, sort of the first step, then they can easily just fall into reactive mode, feel like they have to keep in touch with everybody, which is impossible. So we want them to focus on a precious few, 10 or 20 people. The second step is to figure out where we're at in a specific process. So we've, we've, in the book and in our courses, we've sort of delineated seven different stages of a relationship. The, the earliest is target. I wanna meet somebody, but I haven't met them yet. The seventh is raving fan. That's where the person is, act, we can measure. They're actively running around in the marketplace generating referrals for us. So then there's five steps in between. So step two is figure out where each person on your list is on those seven steps. The corollary to that is we're going to quit judging our relationships like on if people hug us or not, <laughs> because a lot of people say, oh, Jane loves us. You know, she hugs us all the time after meetings. We're like, no, Jane hugs everybody. <laughs> There's, you're, she's hugging your competitors. And by the way, that's where she's sending business. So we don't want to judge relationships based on how outgoing the other person is. We want to judge on actively measuring how they're acting for us. Um, and then the third step is we want to stay in touch with those people. That's based on uh, some science called the mere exposure effect, M-E-R-E, -E, not mere like I look into, but, but the mere exposure of something tends to correlate to likability. So we're, what we've tried to do with the mere exposure effect is let's say there's 10 people on our short list. We want to be in touch. We want to be in front of them adding value in some way once a month. That can be a little article on uh, a sports team they follow. It could be a recipe. It could be a business white paper. It could be something to help in their career. It could be an introduction to one of their peers at another company that they'd find valuable. Anything we can do to stay in touch with them. So if we do those three things, write down a short list. We're going to proactively invest in these relationships, come heck or high water. Number two, know where they're at. And number three, add value on a, on a very periodic but disciplined basis. If we do those three things, we will stay top of mind with those very important people and business will come. Mm. Yeah. I just read a, a book on this actually about more uh, word of mouth referrals and what yeah. people don't uh, realize sometimes in this digital age is that, you know, these word of mouth referrals are, you know, still probably the biggest way that most people get business. Uh, you know, people aren't necessarily getting all the leads from, uh, the internet, as so many people believe nowadays, it is still uh, word of mouth and the relationship part, like you just stated there, is extremely important for that. Well, and, and to build on what you just said is some recent research came out of um, Cornell and Western University of Canada, and they measured the, they call it, scientists call it compliance, but how many times did you get a yes for a request on email? And then they measured face-to-face, -face, same request. And you just like you said, the face-to-face -face ask gets a higher chance of compliance, a higher chance of a yes. But what most people don't know is the power of it. The face-to-face -face ask in their study had a 34 times more likely chance of getting a yes than an email ask. So when, when those word of mouth, those face-to-face -face or say over the phone kind of referrals are made, they have tremendous power versus, say, a social media type of request. 
Mm, definitely something to think about. Uh, I know a lot of people, myself included, sometimes hide behind the computer or the yeah. phone oftentimes, but you know, you have to get out there face to face eventually. And a lot of my business comes from referrals too, from people that I've interviewed, enjoyed the process and you know, try to hook me up with other people. So I definitely know that works well. Uh, let's talk about the third step, managing yourself. What are we talking about there? Just uh, personal development kind of stuff or how does that work? Um, close, but it's very oriented around accountability. So the research on habits is incredibly powerful. And the idea is that if we don't get, we as human beings don't get immediate reinforcement for something, we're far less likely to do it. That's why it's so hard to lose weight because it's a whole lot more fun to eat the cookie <laughs> than it is, you know, to not eat the cookie, but you don't get results over not eating. You gotta, you gotta not eat a hundred cookies and wait three months till you look better in the mirror. So it's easier to eat the cookie. Immediate results, it tasted yummy. <laughs> so for these people we work with that, that have one foot in expertise, one foot in finding people to purchase it, it's so much easier to focus on the delivery of their services or hide behind the email, you know, like you were mentioning, or do things on running the business than it is doing things on business development and growth activities because the payoff is more random and the payoff is farther down the road. So, but, but it's also really important. So we've got to find ways to hack our own habits by measurement and accountability so that we can keep doing a little bit of business development all the time. Uh, when we hear people say, when you're learning a language or a new musical instrument or pr practice or staying in shape, doing a little bit often is a whole lot better than like doing a whole bunch on the weekend, even if the aggregate time was the same per week. And that's the way business development is. So mm -hmm. the way people can do this is they can um, create an account a planning and accountability mechanism, a ritual, if you will, that they do once a week, takes about 15 minutes. And they can plan out, say, what are the three most important things? We call those MITs. What are the three most important things we can do for BD next week that are 100% in our control and that nobody else is asking for? You pick those three things. You say you plan that on from 4.45 to 5 p.m. on Friday afternoon. Then the next week, you tally up how many of the three things did I do? And you pick the, the next week's MITs. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And if somebody does that over an entire year, now they've focused on the 150 most important things that they could do in that year, or about 150, and they've kept the momentum going all year. That one little ritual at 15 minutes once a week will completely change people's growth trajectory because they're tackling the hard things, they're holding themselves accountable, and they're keeping the focus continuously as opposed to all my business dried up. I better focus on business development this week, but it's been a year since I've done it. Oh no, what do I do? And having that sort of roller coaster effect, which is no good for anybody. And I mean, mm. Neil, what do, what do you think? You work with folks on this all the time. Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, I see a lot of people that struggle with uh, goals and managing their time, especially. They might have a list of 20 things to do and they do the four or five easiest things yes. on their list. Like, post a social media post, but it's not one of those most important things that's really going to drive the business. Bingo. It wasn't picking up the phone and calling a, a person that you could jointly give each other referrals and, and planning a, a, a lunch a month out, or it wasn't uh, calling in on that proposal you sent, but you haven't heard back in a month because you're sort of afraid your fees were too high and, and they haven't gotten back to you, but, but you just got to pick up the phone and ask. Those, mm. like you said, you said this so well, we're biased towards the easy, not the important. And if we don't have a mechanism for planning and holding ourselves accountable, accountable for the most important BD activities, most people just won't do them. Uh, let's talk about uh, one of your chapters is targeting your ideal clients and then positioning yourself to win. What exactly does that mean? I know we've touched on it with uh, your explanation so far, but uh, cover that a little bit more, the positioning part. Yeah, yeah. And this fits so well with your expertise as well. Um, so there's a lot of research 
that shows that when people are making claims about themselves specifically, that three things, three concepts that they're, that they're good at or their organization is good at is not only the most believable, and researchers, we go great detail on this particular study in the book, but I'll skip over it for now, but, but researchers have tested one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10 personal claims or corporate claims. And three, oddly, was the most believable. And I would have guessed it was one or two because they're fewer, you know, like it would be easier to be good at one thing than three. But the research actually shows there's some magic to three. Um, additional research found that when it comes to number of concepts that can be remembered later, that three is the magic number there. It was a hair higher, it was like 3.4 was the average, round down to three. And three ends up being the number that's the most believable and the most memorable. So when we're talking about our own ability to solve our clients' problems, we need to be able to crystallize that, not, not into a top 10 list like we're at the end of a David Letterman show, but we, we want to be able to, to crystallize it into the three most important elements for our brand and for that person specifically. And when we can communicate things in threes like that, in short, memorable concepts, then we have a higher chance of being believed and remembered. I mean, what, what do you think in your experience? Uh, I definitely agree with that as well. I think there's a lot of power in the three. Uh, I do see that most of the time on people's websites. I know you have it yourself with the manage opportunities, the manage relationships, yeah. and manage yourself. You've got those yeah. three buckets. And, uh, you know, being an actuary as you are, you look at the data, you know what works, and you go with it. Um, Let's uh, kind of shift angles a little bit here and talk about some of the things that hold people back. What kind of fears uh, do they have getting into this kind of, you know, managing these three buckets that, that you say, uh, rather than just doing what it is that they do best, which is their expertise? Yeah. That's a great question. I've done a sort of a podcast tour lately and Neil, nobody's asked that one. It's a really good one. I think the, the biggest thing that holds people back is that they've got this belief that sales is a bad thing. You know, maybe they had a bad experience at some point being sold to and they know what that feels like. I think I, we probably all have that experience when somebody's got stuff, it, they're clearly in their best interest and, and they're pushing it on us and how awful that feels. But if somebody has that belief about sales or call it business development, client development, whatever we want, if we've got that belief, or if one of your listeners has that belief, they're finished before they start. They cannot be successful if they truly believe that business development is bad. We need to reframe that right now and have people believe business development is about helpfulness. It's about finding people that need our help, but they, they just haven't discovered us yet. Um, it's about being proactive and how can we continue to be helpful for them until the moment's right that they want to hire us. And if we if we substitute the word selling for helping, that will go a long way into, into helping somebody be successful. If they stay with sort of the old bad definition of selling and they really believe that, they're just never going to be able to be great at this because they're going to they're going to stop stop before they start. Another thing that you say in your book is everybody in some way or another is a salesman, whether they know it or not, mm -hmm. they have to sell at some point in their life, even if it's, you know, selling to uh, somebody that you like of the opposite sex, you're trying to sell yourself. So you really do have to be good at it. You do. And uh, it's funny, we've done so many programs now, I think just because we've We've worked with so many high-end professionals and account managers and salespeople, these big organizations, um, Fortune 500 kind of companies that in, in big professional services, that a lot of times the internal functions will hear about us and then ask us to come in. So think of uh, folks in HR roles or IT or finance or marketing. They, in a sense, are running their own consulting firm inside a big entity. And they're in the business of influence too, and because 
they could be being asked for things by their internal clients that aren't the best things for those internal clients. And they've got to be able to shape their relationship in a way that they can be most helpful to their internal uh, clients that they support. So we get a lot of, to your point, we get a lot of people that come through our programs that while they aren't in an external kind of business development or account management or sales role, but they're still in the business of influence. They're still in the business of helping people. And they're still in the business of laddering up their, their ability to help others that they can help in big and meatier ways like they want. And those folks are great to read the snowball system too, because everything in that book is is in a way just about being proactively and influ- in an influential way, be helpful to others, whether you're, mm-hmm. whether you do that externally or internally or, in, or some other way, we're all in the business of influence. Definitely. So let's talk about uh, results here, Mo. If somebody uh, was to take one of your courses or work with you, I'm sure you've got many examples. Uh, what does that look like? What's the time frame look like on that? And uh, what kind of results are they experiencing? Yeah. Uh, gosh, just, there's so many stories. Um, one that just happened yesterday, so this is fun. Um, we're working with a major consulting firm, one of the top management consulting firms in the world. Um, on anybody's short list for one of the most prestigious and best. And we're working with their senior partners and partners and even some of their high sort of high potential principals. And we just got an email yesterday from somebody that sold multi millions of dollars of engagement. I they didn't say the exact number, but I got the figure we were in eight, I got the feeling very strongly we were in eight figures on this one. And uh, it was so cool because the person who wrote the email saying thank you basically to us rattled off all the principles that they used in the process. You know, we build everything together with the client. We got incremental buy-in. There was an issue at some point and and we we heard a very strong objection and we came back with a question as opposed to just trying to guess it what would solve it, which is one of the things we teach. They dug in, they they were consultative and they overcame the objection in the end. Um, Another thing they did was they gave three options to the client. One was a sort of exactly what they wanted, but they gave two very bold options in in varying degrees of investment in in the results, potential results. And we find the science shows that when somebody's given three options, it creates a mental mindset of uh, which one's best for me, as opposed to if you're giving one option, you sort of have the mindset of, do I like it or not? Do I take it or leave it? So the three options really work and the client actually chose one of the boldest options. So it was so cool you know, within, I guess we started that program at the beginning of August and we're now in mid-October. So within just a couple months of using the right principles, you know, they were able to sell somewhere north of $10 million of extra consulting than they would have done otherwise. So things like that are really typical for us because a lot of times folks don't have, they have never been given any really great business development training. And we generally work with super smart people so they're able to put the principles in action quickly and just get, you know, almost an infinite ROI, you know, when you get to numbers like that. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing when you have a system to follow and you're able to change your, your mindset to really understand why that system works. You can, you can see some great results uh, very quickly. Uh, Mo, this is this has been uh, fascinating. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to get the Snowball System book. Uh, I like to get the audio version, and I know you have the audio. It's also available on Kindle and hard copy if anybody wants to go out there and get it. But uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you personally, Mo, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I'll give you uh, three options if people want to learn more. I mean, you, you nailed the first one. Get the book. I mean, you just can't beat it for $16 and change. I think it's on Amazon for right now, but it's in every major bookseller. Um, I know a lot of some of your listeners are in Atlanta. Um, It's at Barnes and Noble nationwide right now. And really at every bookseller there is, including Amazon, obviously. So get the books one way. The other way people can go deeper, and this is free, is they can go to createdemandcourse.com, createdemandcourse.com. And they've We've, we've set up a free eight-part video training series that people get via email that's all about creating demand for their services. And we, we cover a, some of the things we, we covered on this podcast with you, but 
but a ton of other things that are just given um, with all the research and process steps and everything else in great detail. And what's neat about the videos is you can rewatch them, you can forward them to your team, free doesn't hurt. So create demand factor, create demand course.com is a great option. And then the third one is reach out to me via uh, my author site, mobunnel.com. It's M-O-B-U-N-N-E-L-L.com. We can put those in the show notes, I'm sure. And we've got forms there where people can reach out to us and you know, we can be help- we'll strive to be helpful in any way we can. Excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, for being my guest today. I'm definitely going to read the book, The Snowball System. Uh, get out there and get it and get in touch with Mo if you need his help and his expertise on uh, managing your opportunities, managing your relationships, and of course, managing yourself. Uh, Mo Bunnell, he is the founder and CEO of the Bunnell Idea Group. Thank you very much for being my guest on the Trust Factor Radio today. I loved it. Thank you, Neil. You're one of my more dynamic hosts, and I really enjoyed it. And to our listening audience, if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share, and we'll see you next time on the show. You've been listening to the Trust Factor Radio with Neil Howe. To learn about the resources mentioned in the show and to listen to past episodes, go to thetrustfactorradio.com. To get a copy of the book, The Trust Factor, go to thetrustfactorbook.com. If you are ready to act now and build your authority, credibility, and trust, schedule a consultation with Neil at theauthorityarchitect.com. 